writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. This is David Allen Lucas, and welcome to Right Pack Radio. I am your host and author of mystery, sci-fi, and horror, as well as poetry. Today, Right Pack Radio is going to look into and try to conquer the boring hero. With me today is... And I'm your co-host, Kathleen Kayimbe, writer of LGBT fiction and ridiculous, ridiculous, fun, happy times stories under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. The website is not mine. It's, I don't know. Don't go there. Uh, I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a YA fantasy author and illustrator. I'm Melanie Claney. I write uh, nonfiction, science fiction, and fantasy. I'm Matt McGraw. Uh, I'm an amateur short story writer, and uh, I'm working on a picture book called Patrick the Spider with Jennifer. And that's not for kids to want to read. <laughs> I'm Brad R. Cook, uh, author, publisher, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. You can find out more at bradrcook.com. Okay, so in our last episode of the Right Pack Radio, we talked about the necessary villain. And in there we talked about the um, motivations of a hero, which is limited to three things, basically. But what makes a hero boring? Um, I would say the lack of any polarizing personality is what makes a hero boring. So is that because the hero needs to be too likable or because he needs to be an everyman, a blank slate that a blank slate for audiences to project themselves onto? Kind of, yeah, but uh I think also it might be just lack of imagination sometimes. You know, writers we tend to like uh the villains more. Especially if the villain is somebody who's trying to like change the status quo and the hero is for the status quo. Make them a little too boring. Didn't think too much about them. Just kind of needed them as a vessel to explore all the things that did interest you. And so you just kind of leave him like sort of unfinished. Which does make him good for like projecting yourself onto him if you're the reader, but um, maybe not so good on his own. See, I, I would think too often the, the writer tends to fall back on cliches with the hero. More so than the villain, because we're all trying to make a super spectacular villain. And then we'll fall back onto traditional cliches for, you know, our heroes. And, you know, there's many cliches. You've got your standard kind of, you know, Arthurian tale of, you know, finding yourself and de finding your destiny. That kind of classic hero. So I think too often we write that. I mean, Luke well, Skywalker. Yeah. And I think, and I'm, right now I'm going to tick off the entire fandom of a certain DC comic, but eh. And that is... Screw them. Yeah, screw them. <laughs> I really find Superman to be boring. Actually, he was on my list of boring superheroes, too. <laughs> yeah, and so. Because they made him super strong, able to do all these things. He got all the cool powers. He got all the cool powers. He got... Too many, He really. is practically undefeatable, which makes making a villain for him an interesting villain for him, very difficult. If you look at, okay, I'm not, I don't want to slide into villains too far, so mm -hmm. stop me, yeah. but let's, let's, let me compare two sides of a coin. You've got Batman on one side, and this all, uh, uh, Batman on one side, Superman and Wonder Woman I'm pretty on sure the other side. a movie coming out. Yes, there is a well, yeah. Batman and Wonder Woman? <laughs> Batman vs. Superman. Movie. I would oh, watch that Batman movie. Batman vs. Wonder Woman would be a much better movie. <laughs> I, would, I prefer the, the DC that uh -huh. <laughs> Justice League and Lemon, you know, when they were actually uh -huh. uh, dating. That was great. Oh, I would love that romance movie. That, that would be, that would be one I would There's watch a good so fast. rom-com I could get into. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let me pull this back. <laughs> and then I'm going to let you guys go. Um, in the world of Superman... In the world of Wonder Woman, who I actually find Wonder Woman a little more interesting than I find Superman, but regardless, mm. take a look at the proverbial rogues gallery. It's small. It's very limited in the number of villains that they actually have. 
Now, they do have some pretty cool villains. There's a villain who I can't think of that can actually make um, Superman bleed. That's pretty powerful. But really, overall, they're limited. Especially when you compare it to the darker side of the coin, which is Batman. Batman has a forever size rogues gallery. And I think that may be because what's Batman's only superpowers? A, he's an extremely intelligent um, detective. He's supposed to be the world's greatest detective. You can debate that with Sherlock Holmes, but still. And beyond that, he's only his only other superpower is his bank account. Well, and he's very physically fit, but he's not superhumanly fit. He's right. just yeah. Well, he just works out a lot. He crossfits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of squats. Of course, after breaking his back by Bane, uh, it can be questionable. Now, lots of things but... were broken by Bane in that movie. Well, that was actually... <laughs> the limits of reality, yeah. believability, suspension oh, wait. of disbelief. Which, which Bane is this? The one no, with no, the no, funny no, voice? We're, we're or... not talking about <laughs> 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 I was <laughs> actually, in this well, case, I was talking about the one in the comics as well as the movie. But yeah. yeah. Okay, no. Here, we're trying to talk about heroes. And oh, yeah. Because <laughs> villains are more fun. Look, heroes, you're looking this at Harry Potter. He's a little kid who runs around with his wand. You have Luke Skywalker, who's a young kid who runs around with his lightsaber. You have Arthur, who's a little kid who runs around with a sword he pulled out of the stone. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, in terms of heroes, you, you're a little limited, especially in fantasy and sci-fi. Well, okay, I'm going to toss out a favorite hero from that realm. I do have other heroes I can talk about that I enjoy. Um, but I love one, all those heroes, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Good save. But one which I find very interesting is Ryoni Kenshin from Japanese anime. I am picky with my anime. I don't watch that much anime. In fact, Ryoni Kenshin is maybe one of four series I've totally watched, and that's it. Uh, no. there's, some, there's some good heroes in anime. Okay, well, but... Anime is a very... It's a broad, it's a broad. Deep ocean to wade into to just pick every, you know, one It's getting broader other. every year. It's really okay. doing well. Mm-hmm. Okay, now if I've been made bad. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. But no, why am I interested in Ryoni Kenshin? Ryoni Kenshin was an assassin who leaves the battlefield during a, a civil war that would made any of their battles made, would made Gettysburg in America look like a tea party. <clears throat> but he leaves the battlefield and swears he's never going to kill again. And he goes and reinvents himself and tries to refine his humanity, basically, to be able to re sow a battered childhood and this adulthood that he's trying to create after he accidentally killed his one true love in the OAV in his backstory. So I find that aspect where he's finding his own villainy inside himself interesting. But you turn around and let's okay, I'm gonna pick on Let's pick on Hercules. Mm-hmm. Hercules, Superman. Yeah, it's Superman part. Uh, as Hercu- part. Tonight. Hercules had more going for him than Superman did. It, he had to a certain extent problems. because yeah. Yeah. Hercules he wasn't an a anger nice problem. Guy. Mm-hmm. Well, and and, that's that's what made Hercules interesting. And you know, mm-hmm. Superman is is like the Boy Scout times a million. He was generally a nice guy fighting for good, and Hercules most of the time was trying to fix the problem he got himself into. There is the one time (laughs) Superman punched his arm through the Joker, which is pretty cool. Now that's actually... Everyone has their moments. But that was like after the Joker like killed Lois Lane or something? (laughs) Right. Like he murders Lois Lane, and he's like, ha ha ha. He didn't just murder Lois Lane. He murdered Lois Lane and their unborn child. Oh. Not to mention killed a couple million other people. A couple million people. Well, people who cares process. about them? Yeah. So that's one of the rare that's probably times. That's the Joker's point, Superman actually. cares about them. That's okay. one of the rare times in which Superman goes to the dark side. You start to see a little more character aspect to him. But that's that's why it's fun, though, is that exactly. it's kind of... But he's acting like a bad guy. Form. That's the point. He's not like, yeah. acting like a hero. Yeah, let's, let's take a moment to analyze Superman for a moment. We set him up earlier as sort of the definition of the quote-unquote boring hero just because he's not as uh, complicated too as too other narrow. heroes in, in comic books, perhaps. But let's take a look at what they've done to him recently. Specifically with the newest movie, they made him a darker, more brooding person in order to make him more interesting to us. Because I would argue because the 
Dark Knight movies have done so well, okay. so they were kind of following the Nolan train down yeah, track. They were. But I don't have any definitive evidence of that. But, even, know, the right yeah, but at least he wasn't lifting of a planet filled with kryptonite. <laughs> so. And along with the Superman thing, I will also say that the WB version of Smallville, I think, also did a great job with Superboy becoming Superman mm. and that, that, long <laughs> devel- and that long development of the character. So does um, a good hero take a good... I, I was going to say backstory, but it's not really backstory. You need a good background. You know, I mean, there's... They need good motivation. You need a good reason why they're the superhero. So the motives can't be too simple. Superman does what's right because it's right. He didn't really have a reason beyond that. Mm-hmm. See, I would almost say that this is where the rogue hero comes in and is more interesting than the Boy Scout. Because the rogue hero, Han Solo, any number of mm-hmm. people, you know... They are heroes, but they are more interesting because they don't necessarily walk the, the paladin line. Now, earlier we, uh, we were discussing terms earlier before the broadcast, and what you referred to as a rogue hero was referred to as the unexpected hero. See, I wouldn't call it an unexpected hero. Han Solo's kind of expected. You expect... I mean, even he though he's in it for the money... I think he didn't expect it. He either. might not have expected it. But, yes. you, you know, any of the rogue heroes that you look at... I mean, look at Thor. Mm. And I mean from classic mythology, not the long, blonde-haired dude. <laughs> you know, but Thor is classically... He's a hero. He's often cast as the hero. It's for different reasons. Sometimes it's to put right what Loki's done, or sometimes he's just being ultra machismo. <laughs> but, you know, it's... It's not unexpected that Thor is a hero. Just mm. Thor's a little bit more roguish. So, how would uh, Buffy? What category would Buffy the Vampire Slayer fall into? Besides the fact she's, she's not the destined hero. <laughs> she's the what? She's the, the destined hero, hero, just like Luke oh. Skywalker, Harry Potter, mm-hmm. Arthur. Yeah, she's in that same vein. She's a chosen. One. She's in the same vein. She's a chosen one. But she was a chosen one. Person. Now she's more interesting. But why? What mm-hmm. makes her more interesting? Whedon probably. <laughs> Well, she was I mean, funny. I, yeah, she, well, yeah you nailed one. that one right on the head. For the 90s, <laughs> yeah. she was hot. So, you know, that was that too. That was more... Not more anymore is what we're saying. Oh, that was me. I apologize for that. I didn't realize that was going to happen. So, as we, as we have a t- technical difficulty there... Um, but so, yeah. wait a minute. But the thing about Buffy, I think maybe that made her interesting, even though she was the chosen one is that she had other interests that weren't heroic. They weren't anti-heroic necessarily, but she cared about her life too. And Possibly, but she was also one of the first big female heroes. And I mean that in the sense of the way 90s television and culture was shifting. Uh-huh. You know, She popped up as one of the big female heroes, which did set her apart from other chosen line stories. You know, Most chosen line stories seem to come with a white man. This time we got, you know, a woman. Right. So that makes it slightly more interesting. She's still white, though. So that's good. That's good. No, that's <laughs> good. But, but some, okay. It also has a diversity, no. Uh, some but, of the, uh, the, that's the other thing. She got her own Justice League at, at the end. And uh, yeah. some, of, some of the former ones and some of the future ones weren't white. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. But one of the things I always find that... Well, uh, sorry, I was going to say in terms of minority heroes, you have somebody like Shaft, who isn't necessarily... You can't, you can't throw throw hero. You took my... Uh, you took I took a your, piece of my thunder. Dang, sorry. One, He's one like an Shaft. anti-hero, though, isn't he? Shaft, yeah. He is and the that's one of my favorites more here. is the anti-heroes. You got Shaft, um, who very much street cred. Um, one of my favorite heroes, both in literature, though he's kind of a sidekick in literature, as well as on TV show... Is Hawk. Yeah. Hawk is in the Robert B. Parker universe of Spencer for Hire, or Spencer novels. It's a mystery series. Uh, and a, even Spencer himself is a jagged hero. He is an anti hero. Yeah. But Hawk is a hitman. Yeah. And he does, he, he, when he's not being a hitman, he's at Spencer's side for his own reasons. He has this mutual respect with Spencer, really kind of an odd friendship, and he's always there. Now, if you want to know who played Hawk in the TV series, you can always look it up for our, le- our listeners, but Avery Brooks, yeah. who is also known as Captain Sisko in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And when they finally oh. shaved his head in Deep Space Nine is when he became super kick butt. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about Avery with hair and no hair. He, he then became it. Hawk on Deep Space Nine, exactly. and it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, other characters who... 
Okay, now I'm going to step away from a, from the black characters for a second. I'm going to jump to a white character. Yes. And, and <laughs> I don't... I, I hate breaking characters into race. I hate breaking people into race. But one of my favorites in a sci-fi show was Michael Garibaldi from, Bab- from Babylon 5. In his case, Michael was an alcoholic. And during the five-year run, there, he battles alcoholism. It comes up multiple times. He is willing to put himself at risk to save who he needs to save, who he wants to save. But he gets broken. And I'm spoiler alerts, everybody. He gets broken by Walter, K- Walter Koenig's character, Alfred Bester, who's a psychop, which is a psionic, forces Garibaldi to do something against his will, and that sends Michael right into the bottle, and he has to get back out of it. He goes throughout the entire show drinking water normally because he has not met a bottle he didn't like. Either one of you two. Uh, well, what I'm noticing, there's a little trend here with uh, this Garibaldi guy and Kenshin. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's that they kind of have, they have dark, like, backstories. You know, they have, a, like, a history of some kind of problem that they're trying to get rid of. And the heroism comes as part of overcoming it. I've noticed it's a personal problem, not a background problem. For instance, Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker, they both have issues. They're both orphans, but it's not a personal demon for them. <laughs> They're yeah. rising from an unfortunate situation, not necessarily a past demon. Yeah. And one of the things different between them and Batman is the case of Harry Potter, the case of um, Luke Skywalker, they're getting out of their family's control over them so they can go and become who they're supposed to become. Batman actually was held on to his humanity thanks to Alfred who is technically his family, as well as Lucius Fox and others, and was able to keep on keep going. So it's really separate. Okay. Well, and Bruce Wayne was really traumatized by his parents' death. So it's, I mean, he was orphaned too, but mm-hmm. he so was not orphaned the same way Harry Potter was orphaned. Both parents died a violent death, but one deeply scarred, you know, Harry wasn't really... Harry was more he, scarred he by... He was scarred. It was just lightning bolt shape. Yeah, it was... Mm. Well, and... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literal but, scarring. Yeah. yeah. But he was also... Harry was the kid that... Um, most of his scarring came to do with his miserable childhood. And, I mean, he wasn't really even scarred by that. Mm-hmm. He didn't... His aunt and uncle didn't like him. But even that, it seemed to, you know, bounce off him his, psychologically. His, his aunt and uncle basically should have been um, taken to family services for child abuse. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be they did not treat all, him honestly. well at all. No, that was very abusive. It's like they did the minimum required. But yeah, somehow, I, I'm pretty certain you can't lock a kid in underneath, underneath the stairs. I'm yeah. pretty certain that's not allowed. It's, well, it's uh, his room under sort the of, stairs. Yeah, it's they're still. sort of cartoonishly abusive, actually, yeah, in the early books. Yeah. It's yeah. the tone. The yeah. tone is yeah. different between Harry Potter's child abuse so that, and yeah. Batman's childhood trauma. trauma right. In Batman's childhood trauma, it's given the weight that such a thing would probably give someone. He, of course, takes it to an extreme and becomes a masked vigilante. But Harry, his is played more as, look how awful his real life, normal life that he would have had before magic is to make magic that much more fantastic. So let me pull something here. I'm going to go to the an early hero, not the beginning of heroism, because that would take us back to mythology. At least. <laughs> an early hero that was a prototype to Batman. And what's interesting about this hero is he was the first, I believe, the first hero to have a secret identity. In his Bruce Wayne style, and I'm purposely using Batman because he's really Batman was based on this one on this character among another one. In his Bruce Wayne style, he was a millionaire, a flop, a boring ass character in general. Well, he was funny because you knew he had the secret identity. Well, he was funny because of that, but if you were just to take that personality, he was boring. 
his other side of his personality, with which he had an entire league of gentlemen working with him, crossing over the over the English Channel into Revolutionary War France and stealing people who were being accused falsely or because they were aristocratic from the actual guillotine and bringing them back into England where they would be safe, that was a swashbuckling character. And that was a fun character. And in case anybody is interested in knowing what character I'm talking about, I am talking about the Scarlet Pimpernel, written by Baroness Oakstreet, or o- how, I always call her Oakstreet, um, O-C-Z-R-Y, I believe. We really need to post this on the website. Yeah, and <laughs> take written originally in the early 1900s. And they've made movies of yes. this, and they've made at least one parody of it. I think it's mm-hmm. the Purple Pimpernel. And they made a musical of it, which was kind of sort of a parody, but also fun. Um, A&E did a fantastic series based on the books. Anyway, what makes a hero boring? Back to the original topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I always found in Greek mythology, a lot of those heroes were boring. Mm -hmm. Atalantia, a heroine. She can outrun any man. Oh, yeah. And... She gets tripped up because some guy puts golden apples in front of her. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to. Well, you were starting a list, weren't you? Didn't you have yeah. a whole bunch of listed ones? Another one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one thank example. you. I'll let you know. <laughs> I, got, I appreciate that. I'll um, jump in at the end of this train of boring heroes. Odysseus, who is one who walks the line between boring and not boring. Odysseus is on a mission to return to his family after the Trojan War. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, he I takes a while. Kind of. He needed GPS. <laughs> well, he needed, he needed to get GPS. off his ass. He spent a year at Cersei's. You, a yeah. year. Well, okay. Over. And she's like a magical sex demon. <laughs> she turned all all his, but that a year but that's with a all his sex. In the past, the year was like a week. Okay. <laughs> but exactly, he would stop off of these various things, have adventures. He shacked up with Cersei, even though he's supposed to be in love with his wife, who is being. <laughs> Um, but he was the ideal Greek manly dude. I know. Honorable and holding off all these suitors. Then he also shacked up with another woman who I can't think of a character's name before Cersei. He has he eventually lands after he kills after he gets his entire crew killed. Um, <laughs> which actually they actually get themselves killed, to be honest. Uh, six of one. Six of one after <laughs> the other. It's all the anger of the gods. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he goes dressed up as a beggar to his house, finds out what's going on, and saves the day. With the greatest arrow shot in history. <laughs> yes. He would make Robin Hood look look puny. And if you don't like Cat that history. one and you want to stick with the other side of a Trojan War, read the Aeonid, which is about Aeonias leading the Trojans out of the fall of Troy. And then, eventually, they found Rome, and he has the same type of role. Jason, same thing. Go ahead. Uh, the Even. trend I've noticed in the list, uh-huh. and in all these other lists, is that the boring hero is the one in which the exciting thing about him is what he does. Uh-huh. The exciting thing about him is the adventure he goes on. Not, not necessarily him himself. He himself doesn't need to be exciting. He just has to be the go-kart that the audience gets in and goes from place to place. And what happens to the hero then happens to us. It's to, uh, to make it less epic, I'm going to cite the Twilight Saga. Because every little girl and middle-aged woman and other persons <laughs> who like Twilight, uh, they don't care about Bella. No one cares who Bella is or what Bella's doing. They just want to date either Jacob or Edward. <laughs> and Bella is the pair of pants you put on when you get in the book that you wear around and experience <laughs> the adventure. It, and that's her role. That's her job. And they don't want her to be anything more than that because when she starts showing personality, she's not nice. <laughs> no. She's not a very nice person. I heard someone say that she was, if you looked at her from not the rosy Twilight fan perspective, that she's actually a really great villain because she's manipulating these two men down to the to the tiniest detail to make them do exactly what she wants, and somehow ends up with, ex- you know, what she wants to have in the end, and both of them in some way, even though she's been nothing but evil to them this whole time. 
Well, that's the story for another, you know, yeah. thing. But so, really, these heroes are like uh, those ants that get the fungus, which drives them up the... Uh, it drives them around like a little car. The yeah. zombie, so, ants. zombie ants. Zombie ants, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we are the fungus. <laughs> and we're the brains fungus. of the ants. Well, I think the part of the issue here, and this is all something we've talked about, is having a deep, you know, character with with multiple sides to the multiple facets, some which are good, some which are clearly borderline. You know, that's going to give you the, you know, un, uh, the interesting hero. You know, some heroes, I think it's definitely right, you, we want to be the hero, but then there are other heroes... That it's like we want to identify not necessarily ourselves with the hero, but like that's someone I know. That's just like, you know, that's a character. So like a detective novel, you keep hearing uh, the same, you know, might be a different story, but it's the same person. Uh, I think I I get a little bit of what you're saying. Um, I wanted to bring, uh, it made me think of kind of Indiana Jones, you know, trying to, thinking about who... Uh, who you want to be as opposed to uh, who you are. Like, when you're watching an Indiana Jones movie, you don't look and say, man, Indy, I'm just like that. You look at Indy and you say, I wish I was like that. Because he's, he's, you know, bopping around the globe and shooting guys and getting in fights and discovering stuff and going on great adventures. And so it's wish fulfillment. So he's it's a wish, wish fulfillment. fulfillment. But when you look at Indiana Jones himself, how interesting is he as a human? Like, do you know what he would say to you if you sat down across the table over coffee? He'd probably go off on you. Where'd you, where'd you put the medallion? Where's the medallion? Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have a whole lot of substance himself other than that he's cool. He's got, like, a and, failed marriage, daddy issues. I mean, he's got the He's got his professorhood. He's yeah, a character the, type. Yeah. I always he's like him in the jacket. He's, the, he's yeah. a roguish He's the hat and the jacket and the whip. whip. That is what Indiana yeah. Jones is. And anyone who puts on that costume becomes Indiana Jones and that's and exactly the what they want. It's the hat. <laughs> it's totally the hat. There's a reason that all his intros have the hat. Yeah, there's just there's always like the shadow of it, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is Bond a suit and a gun then? Yes. Yes. Oh, Bond and the nice half car. Naked. Well, Bond the most is recent super... Bond is more awesome. interesting. Yes. yes. Well, okay. I like the most recent Bond and well, I've not liked any Bonds before. There's two there's two types of Bonds. Both in movies and two different types of bonds in the sense of movie versus the books. The books you told me about sound way more interesting. The books are, in my opinion, way well, more interesting. That's kind of what they do in Casino Royale and the yeah. subsequent movies, that they're kind of bringing him back in. I like that bond. Yeah. That bond like and that. the Sean Connery <laughs> bond were more of the anti hero. They're action bonds. They're action bonds, <laughs> as opposed to romantic bond. Well, and then you had, um, and I'm going to really tick off a whole fandom of a bond. You're on a roll. I'm on a roll, so hey, guys. Feel free. Send me hate mail. Send me hate mail. Send me all the way. But We've the Roger the Moore bonds. The Roger Moore bond was pretty much a comic. It was a, and I mean that both in the sense of a comic book style hero as well as comedy. It really was way off the wall. No way realistic. It and was he, the 70s and 80s, though. It so was the 70s and 80s. Are you saying I he was more that. like farcical Bond? Like he was very much. Himself? No, he was romance Bond because his action is limited. He wears a girder, girdle in a couple of them. <laughs> but the, the real thing is that, I mean, he's there to romance the woman mm-hmm. and get in that way. Every time Roger Moore comes to a situation, he finds a way to romance his way in and out of it. My right. eye is twitching because of that. It's twitching. <laughs> Unlike Daniel Craig, who's more going to hit somebody in the face. Yes. And then have an epic chase scene. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the more one is him more like... Arrow camera. <laughs> that's more like cartoonish, really, is how mm-hmm. they do that. It's, it's yeah. like, well, they're, they can't take it seriously in that time period. Well, like George Lazenby, he seriously. was a romance Bond, too. Yeah. He was only in the one. He was only in the one, but he was still more of the romance Bond <laughs> like, than the action Bond. Like, you know, yeah. Sean really Connery is going to punch somebody in the face. Yes. Timothy Dalton was a little more darker than yeah. Yeah, and Roger Moore was. He, was. he started the trend back. I'm curious about his Bond because I heard that people did not react well to him. It didn't, and they but really he wanted uh, interesting. They really wanted Pierce Brosnan, but Pierce Brosnan was contractually tied up to with Roman, uh, Remington Steele. Right, Romantic so, Steele. <laughs> Remington, <laughs> Remington <Yeah>. Steele. <laughs> but and also too, I, I'm, in a way, I'm glad Pierce Brosnan. Didn't get it. Not because I'm anti Pierce Brosnan. I am far from it. I think he aimed himself at being James Bond. I loved him as James Bond. He was dreamy as James Bond. Well, 
Well, in your opinion, okay. no, no, he wasn't. Not my I opinion. hated him. I thought he was but, training. But just saying, the girl Pierce, if you are listening, <laughs> to this, the girls at the right pack like you and think you're dreamy. As do the boys. Hey, yeah, totally so I don't go he does that whole come out of North Korea and then go to the Chinese like you know yeah. hotel and yeah, exactly. Oh. Good scene. But <laughs> where I was going with it is with the James Bond films, you had a transition from the comic book character of Roger Moore to back to what James Bond really was like in the books, and that's where Timothy Dalton comes in. He starts that transition. If Pierce Brosnan had done the movies that, that Timothy Dalton had done, I don't know if Pierce would have been as good of a Bond. As, at least as well-received. Let me rephrase it. As well-received as a Bond. And I think that's where poor Timothy comes into play is he was the first one to try and move it back there. And that's difficult. And he had to convince an entire fandom. Well, they had that weird cult thing in that one movie. So. <laughs> yes. The that, drug cult. Yes. Um, real fast, though, before I forget them, and I do want... I'll, I'm going to change subject back to the boring character. Boring ones. I mentioned a little while ago some diverse um, broken characters, and I remember two while we were talking that I really want to do a shout-out to. Walter Mosley, who is a fantastic both playwright and mystery writer and, in a way, fancy writer. Oh, he's written some sci-fi, too. And written some sci-fi. But two of his series I absolutely love. One, or, sorry, one's a series, one's a collection of short stories. One series is Easy Rollins, a black man in the 1950s, if I remember right, could be 40s. And he is, he's, becomes a private detective because he's forced into it at first. And, and deals a lot with racism and so forth at that time period. Another character who I absolutely love, and this actually introduced me to Walter's writing, is Tempest. Tempest is a... Well, he gets, he's, he's a man of the street, basically. He gets killed. Goes to heaven. Wait, and heaven goes, uh, no, you're in the wrong spot. You're supposed to go to hell. And Tempest says no. In fact, he doesn't just say no. He says, oh, hell no. And so it goes back to Earth, and the whole entire rest of the series is about the angels and the demons trying to convince him to go to hell, and he's exercising free will. Another classic hero that Why can would... be found in Constantine. Exactly. I was thinking Constantine. Yeah. You know, a whole slew of, you know, which is going any of the prophecy the movies, any of those kinds of things. Which goes to my topic. If, in our villain talk, we talked about the thousand faces of a villain. I'm going to talk about A Thousand Faces of a Hero, which actually is a book written by Joseph Campbell. Good book. Great, yes, great book. Um, and in all honesty, every book we're reading technically is a hero's journey. It is mythology being retold in a new way. So, which goes back to my statements about um, boring characters in, from myth, but... Who are some other boring characters from mythology or from anything that's come out of myth? I have a question, actually, about okay. that. Um, if what we seek in stories is basically the same old story told in a different way, in a new and unexpected way, why are is are the heroes being problematic in many cases, like boring, because we're not doing anything new with them? Well, I was thinking there are more limitations with heroes than there are with villains. I was just thinking one thing. If you're reading a book, you know for almost certain that the hero can't die till the last chapter. And probably won't die in the last chapter. But if the villain, if the hero's going to die at all, they're not really in any danger till the very end. They have to get there. Exactly. You see, this is one of the things I absolutely loved about a TV show which over in England was called Spooks. And I'm looking at Brad because I know he watched this as well. We talked about, <laughs> we called it here in America because the term spooks, unfortunately, has a racist term. Uh -huh. So we called oh, it yeah. MI5. Mm, yeah, the yeah. term spooks, for those who don't want to apply it to racism, means spy. It's for the spy industry. And in the very second episode of Spooks, the normal formula for a spy story is... The good guy comes out in the end and everything's good, good. which is kind of boring. It's boring because you know it's going to happen. Exactly. It's been seen before. So what they did in the second episode of Spooks is two of the good guys get captured. One's a male, one's female. The female 
while being interrogated, has her head put into a fry fryer, into the hot burning oil. Now this was special effect to people, but Certainly it looked so. it looked <laughs> real, and they put her head in there. She's screaming. She does. A, I can't think of the actress's name right off the head. She does a fantastic job, and you don't see that much of it. The director is relying on psychology, and then of course the bad guy shoots her. Woman in the refrigerator? No, he's no. He just shoots her. <laughs> I'll get him later. And what, ha- what comes Similar out of this? Different. Fries her and puts her in the fridge. What comes out of that of from, from the viewer? From the viewers is suddenly you had all the viewers going. Holy, you know what? Or actually, I guess in their case, bloody hell. <laughs> they, they, they're knocked out of the formula, and now the characters, which technically would have been boring, have been knocked off the formulaic writing and have become of interest. Well, George R. R. Martin did the same thing. I agree. In Game of Thrones. So Joss Whedon, everything Joss Whedon. Um, that's well, he. He goes with certain rules for that. Let's be yeah. honest. He does yes, have his own He makes formula. us Nobody love died. people before he kills them. Well, okay. Why? But the main people probably aren't going to die. Uh, until uh, the very end, except for the yeah. sacrificial lamb well, that yeah. you don't the necessarily know is going to be sacrificial. But that's after the story. No, I mean, that's the oh, end no, of the story. No. You don't care about that. For no, instance, that's the middle of the story okay, because yeah. the sacrificial lamb happens in the middle of the story or close to the end of the story as an inciting. Event that makes the heroes do also, also lets you know that the author means business. Mm. And it means <laughs> nobody is safe. Yeah. yeah. Someone that you thought was bulletproof could die. Um, that was you Anyone could die at any time. Yes. <laughs> what? Um, go ahead. I, I, no, 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 no. Don't no, mind please. me. No, no, please. I'm, I'm not going to get back on another wash. I'm going to let okay. you guys go. Oh, <laughs> for, for, the, for the record, Jennifer was in I'm love. Still with in the mourning. Yeah, she's in mourning. I'm still in mourning for, for, for my Wash. beloved Hope <laughs> from Firefly. From, from Great, yeah. Okay, I want to toss out a possibility. This is something I've been thinking about as we've been talking. In commercial fiction versus literary fiction, and what I mean by that is, you get the academics usually publishing literary fiction. The big difference is, is commercial fiction historically has been more plot driven. Where literary fiction has been more character driven and sometimes plotless. My question to you is the hero, as we've been kicking it back and forth, both with the broken hero and the blank hero, like Hercules in that case, um, is it the story that they are in defining the hero? In other words, take Superman, take Hercules, take whatever, and is it's more of a plot driven story. Take Perry Mason. Yes, I'm throwing in mystery. It's more a plot-driven story, whereas the other side of the coin, some of the characters I've mentioned, some of the characters other ones have mentioned, it's been more character development throughout the story, and that makes them less boring. Uh, yeah, that might be just the difference, is that there's a sort of variation between plot-driven and character-driven, which is, I think plot-driven tends to be more fantastical, Mostly. Not necessarily. Well, not even just in like being uh, having like swords and sorcery yeah. and stuff, mm-hmm. but even like you know like Die Hard maybe. Mm-hmm. Or like physical danger gets chucked at people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like it's a very commercial. It's yeah. very gritty danger, but it's like it's still a fantastical story where he's like he's out to destroy evil and get his marriage back and all that. And then like you know character driven stuff is more about just like. People interacting in ways that people would. It's closer to reality. It's as if the world, if, as if the the fictional entity it has a narrow field of interest, and you can either focus on the character or on the stuff the character does. Yeah, and like, uh, and in reality, I think there aren't really like strong heroes or villains in the world that we all share here. Mm-hmm. So the closer you get to reality, the harder it is to have that. No, wait a minute. I haven't read Game of Thrones. But doesn't that have both? Hmm? Game of Thrones, doesn't that have both characters and real big action? Kind of. About it's Game of Thrones, I think, it, I, think it's, um, I think it struck a good balance, Game of Thrones and books like um, Patricia Briggs' series um, about Marcy Thompson. You need to have, for an interesting character and an interesting story, both an interesting character and an interesting story, you need to have events plot mm-hmm. that is good and engaging and pushes the hero to be better and you need the hero to have a, an interesting and 
complex inner life mm -hmm. because otherwise you're just left with one or the other. You're left with navel gazing or, oh my goodness, now it's a car and now mm -hmm. it's a train and I'm still driving away from the apocalypse, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, the hero's journey, especially in literary, is, is rarely a physical confrontation. It's rarely anything that is action oriented and it's usually an internal journey. I mean, if you look, you know, take classical literature, if you look at The Great Gatsby, the hero is technically, I guess, supposed to be Gatsby. But yet at the same time, you know, what heroic thing does Gatsby do really in the novel? I mean, I'd more say Nick's probably the hero or something like that. He's the narrator. But mm -hmm. he's the narrator, but who's the hero of it? You know, the villains are even hard to Just, spot. Uh, Catcher in the Rye. That's Catcher a very the Rye. Well, thing. no, no, take, uh, take something like the Scarlet Letter, you know. Mm -hmm. You've got Hester in that, and you've got her in her whole mm -hmm. journey and her overcoming, you know, everything within that. That's a hero's journey Those on some level. An external reflecting the internal journey. And, and that's part of literary, and there's other types of literary, I mean, you could go to, but it tends to be either an internal journey or it tends to be something having to do with characters and it's way less defined as to who the villain, who the hero, who those kinds of things are in literary novels. And that might be one reason why they're more interesting and not boring because we, we have more there than just, you know, the journey. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, um, I'm going to try and say an author's name without mispronouncing it. Mm -hmm. Lois McMaster's Bourgeois. Bourgeois, yeah. Okay. Bourgeois? No. no. <laughs> anyway, she's written uh, fantasy and sci-fi. I'm specifically talking about her Miles Bukosikin novels. But um, point is, she thinks a series. Each novel, you should be able to read and get it and appreciate it and enjoy it just picking up a novel anywhere. But it should be every series you write. Yeah, but through the series, no, I'm mean, she's she's talking about what defines a series versus a multi-volume novel. But the so I think she almost does it. Most of her character development is from book to book. Not all. Yes, certainly characters develop within a book, but you can definitely see how they're changing and developing between books. And with you know, and, but she has adventure stories a lot happening in the book. Uh, that reminded me of a uh, class online by um, Holly Lyle that uh, is about how to write a series. It's called How to Write a Series. And she goes into, I guess, the big four things that you need to get straightened out in your head. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those things was what kind of series is it? Is it a really big book? Is it like a series of standalones? You could pick up anyone and be fine. Or is it like there's an overarching plot that goes from this, that goes a span of the series, but then each book also has its own self-contained mm -hmm. plot. And I think also, too, that concept shows a difference in the time period of stories written and where we've gone for a squeaky clean character hero. Example, Perry Mason. Fantastic. I love the series. I love the TV series. I love the old radio dramas. But, in all honesty, Perry Mason doesn't change that much along the journey. That's what really bugged me about a lot of Star Trek. Right, Star Trek. It's like, okay, yes, this character was tortured. He experienced a good 20 years of time. I'm talking about Brian from Deep Space Nine. And then in the next episode, he was fine. Well, that's <laughs> another thing that she brings up, time. Yeah. Is it like, does everything repeat itself? Like, does everything reset at the end? Like, all of the shows that yeah. I read as a kid or Boxcar uh -huh. Children books, you know? Or do things have consequences? That was the thing that bothered me about Iron Man 2. Mm -hmm. Is that we went through the first Iron Man, which was a fantastic movie, mm -hmm. and it got me into a superhero and Marvel in general when I didn't care anything about Marvel before then. Um, we got invested in Tony, and we got to see him be a terrible person and become a less terrible person. And I was very disappointed when I saw Iron Man 2 in the theater because when I showed up, terrible Tony was back, and I didn't know why. Because I thought he'd grown a little bit. Well, okay, he is actually, that's actually bringing up Stark's a good point, because he's actually not a boring hero. Yes. Mm -hmm. And especially if you go back to the comic books, and you take, you know, the actual character of Tony Stark, and I agree, you know, two, and even when you get into three, there's some issues with that. But taking Tony out and just looking at the character, mm -hmm. he's, got a, he's got the hero quality of wanting to actually save the world, mm -hmm. mostly because that would benefit his ego, <laughs> but... It's that, it's, it's the dark side of Tony. It's the guy who's, you know, a womanizer. It's the guy who has all these issues. It's the guy who's alcoholic. a drug addict. It's, yeah, you know, alcoholic, it's yeah. those, yeah, and the alcoholic. It's those issues that are, that make him more interesting 
than half the other Avengers. I dare say it's watching him try and overcome those yeah, issues. Yeah, exactly. Interesting, which is why I was interested in him in the first movie, and I was so disappointed in the second because I wanted to see his journey continue, not regress back. And to see, where you it take started. somebody like Captain Captain America, mm-hmm. who is very much the the Boy Scout, just like Superman. He's you know, a, he's he's America. a super mm-hmm. soldier. You know, he's and all Superman that kind of without stuff. As, as many superpowers. Well, he, he can't he fly, fly, but, he can't fly. but the point is, is he's not as interesting a hero as Tony is in terms of a character and you can mm-hmm. almost do more with Tony Stark Tony know. Stark can have a story that's about Tony Stark mm-hmm. not necessarily about Iron Man yeah. he when exists you... as Iron Man and that's great and if you look he at, does a good job as Iron Man and if you look at the Captain America movies they're not he necessarily no about life. Steve's journey it's about what Captain America is doing to clean up America I wrote notes well, at the Captain America second movie, which I really loved, and it kind of crystallized some things I realized about why I really liked that movie. And it was a good movie. It was. It was a good movie. One of the things I loved about that movie and the Avengers film was that all of the heroes that are trying to work together are working for their own reasons, their ideology, their ideologies, and their you know. Beliefs and even their powers are just like butting heads with one another. Well, and that was always kind of a feature of the Avengers over, yeah. say, the Justice League, which you know, yeah, but is like a big club, exactly. <laughs> and I think that adds conflict, like within the characters, the cast themselves, that is completely divorced from the actual. Well, it inter- coming to it invade interacts the with yes. the actual. It's yes. not divorced from it, yes. but it's. It it's makes a, it. It's worse. another element. <laughs> one, one, I'm sorry. I'm just going to retrograde and then I'll let you guys go back. Because something Noni said, as soon as she said it, crystallized something in my head, and that is, let's go back and re- just briefly look at Superman, Perry Mason, Captain America, and versus what I talked about Spencer from Spencer for Hire, and Batman and all that. Well, Batman. I'm sorry. Actually, he kind of falls out of this. <laughs> forget Batman. Forget I said Batman for a second. In the case of <laughs> Superman, in the case of the Captain America, in the case of Perry Mason, when you look at the character, they have no life outside of their job. In all honesty, Captain America, no life. He's running, he's doing whatever, he's training. Superman. Steve's not hitting on the women heroes. Steve's not hitting on the, <laughs> on the women heroes. No. Superman. He's running around redoing stories. He's, he's got a kid. He's, 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 he's got, got a job. job. He's, he's got a job. But even though he's in love with Lois Lane, there's not much outside the job that he's doing. He really needed to find somebody besides Lois Lane. <laughs> yeah, irregardless. He Just like a Harry Mason, who I know some of us yes, haven't Robert. seen or read the books, but those who have, he is a workaholic. The guy is in his law office till midnight, 1 mm-hmm. o'clock. With his secretary. Mm. And, <laughs> yeah, there is that hint. There, trust me, if you read the books, that hint's there, more than plenty there. Oh, my. There's a uh, Sherlock, but, too. And, uh, like, right. he famously, uh, my favorite thing about him in the books is that uh, whenever he's not on a case, he sits on his, in his apartment and does drugs. Right. Well, <laughs> everything is boring he's, if he's not solving Right, and, yeah, yeah, and he's give him, literally nothing but else. And in, Sherlock is actually more interesting because he's tortured by his boredom. But, he has inner demons as well as outer things to find. One thing with Sherlock, though, and I like I love that character, but one thing with Sherlock is, if it's some information that's outside the realm of crime, criminology, well, at least this is what we call it nowadays, crime, criminology, criminal psychology, and so forth, he doesn't want to know it. Watson tells him that, I figure what, how many planets at the time, there were X number of planets in the solar system that circle around the sun. And Holmes like, thanks, now i got to forget this. Mm. Well, he's got so much he's got other Right, he's got other things. Now let's look, go back to the other side of the coin, the more, less boring characters, the Spencers, the Iron Men, and so forth. They have other interests. Spencer for hire. He's a farmer boxer. He still trains. He has this ongoing, stable, how's that for rarity of a hero, Someone stable relationship with a psychologist. Well, no wonder. And, <laughs> oh. Yeah, and, there's, and, he's a, and he's a gourmet cook. Is he paying him? The psychologist? No, he doesn't pay her. He pays her in food. Uh, but yeah, yeah he, gives, he, he pays her in the gourmet food. Um, you get Tony Stark. Tony Stark has other interests. He is an inventor. 
He had he is always inventing. He always he had he loves fast cars, fast women too, and he loves to party. But he has his other interests beyond well, he, his work. One of the thing, one of the reasons he mm-hmm. is interesting to me is that he does all those you know, self-destructive behaviors because the extent to which he goes is self-destructive. And that's because there are things he does not want to face in his life. Right. They all stem from issues he's having that he can't deal with appropriately. Massive chest pain. <laughs> is, it, is it just the, like... Stabbing pains. Oh. Uh, going back to Sherlock, I guess. Mm-hmm. The thing with Sherlock is he doesn't, he doesn't have any other stuff going on. He wants to forget about the planets and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But I think it's kind of to his virtue as like a detective, and that he's just he's focused on his job. He knows he's doing good in the world. He's using his intellect. I don't think he even cares about possible. doing good in the world. He just no, wants he, this, but like he does. Got, he's got a one track mind, completely focused, and you never quite know which direction he's going to go. He, I think he's like a doctor. It's supposed to be. He's like a doctor who doctor. I was going to say <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking about doctor. Or, Who's a doctor looking at society as his patient doctor Strange. and looking for the disease of the crime. Go ahead, Doug. Keep going. But yeah, it's like it's to his virtue, I think. And what I hear in a lot of uh, more interesting heroes is they have more like downsides. So is it just that like Holmes is a but, little too perfect? No, it's it's that well rounded character. So you you have to have your good sides, which for Superman is all his great superpowers and his awesomeness. But the problem is is that the kryptonite isn't enough of a downturn. To make us go, this is a really interesting well, character. Well, planet got destroyed. But, but well, I mean, it's kind of interesting that he does have alien. that one fallibility. But he to somebody really like Sherlock him. or somebody like Tony Stark, yeah. I mean, Tony's got a whole litany of things that are on that dark side. But Sherlock yeah. is annoying. He's misogynistic. <laughs> he so is Tony Stark. <laughs> no, yeah. he's not misogynistic <laughs> after the story with the girl who the, uh, woman. the woman. Oh, yeah, the woman. Yeah. The woman. Who the puts woman. it over Irene. on him? Irene. Yeah, that yeah. tricks him. Yeah, she steals Irene like those Irene. photos yeah. or whatever. Yeah, she yeah. tricks him. And then he's like, him yeah. fall in love with her. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if he's in love with her. I think he admires oh, her greatly. He is, she is the woman. She's the one. The woman. Um. So is does there have to be more negative with a person to make them interesting? Let me answer that in a sense of a hero, and I'm going to. I'm going to use somebody who would not like me using the term of hero towards him, so I'm not going to say his name. Now you're pissing off the fictional characters. Oh my no, goodness. No, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a real life person who I think a lot of us, if we knew about what he did, would define him as a hero, and that is he was a mind hunter. What the hell am I talking about? He was an FBI profiler. He hunted down, and I think all the FBI profilers I've either seen or have met or, and this is a case of a lot of real-life detectives that I've, that I've personally have known. When they look in the face of evil, irregardless of how much of a Boy Scout they might have been at one time, or if they had a jagged side to their real personality, there is something that happens that causes a jagged edge. In the case of the person I'm talking about, for example, he couldn't sleep much. Because of everything he saw. He ends up having a divorce. He almost killed himself. And that he almost died on the job. Let me rephrase that. He didn't try to commit suicide. Mm. He almost died on the job. And it kind of woke him up. But that took it took that level to get there. Now that's also a hero's journey in another way. I was gonna say that's kind of basically the tortured hero that yeah. we've been talking about. Your Batman, you know, any number Yeah, but of it doesn't guys. have to be a failing. It's it could be a cost of what being a uh, hero has that's to be going, a cost. That's something. where I'm going with one thing. I'm gonna use another character. This one's hero. This this one is a fictional character and I I'm not gonna name I can't I'm not gonna name his name the actor because I have trouble pronouncing his name. But if you saw Thor, he's the actor who played um uh, <laughs> ah, Hem, Hemdall. Hemdall. Heimdall. Heimdall. Uh, Idris Elba. Idris Elba. Thank you. I, I always have pronounced problems pronouncing it. And I respect his acting too much. It's okay. Why do people, people get tongue tied when they look at his face? You know yeah. exactly yeah. where I'm going. <laughs> Luther also but that's is a still the tortured character. He is a tortured character. But Luther going with the cost. He he ends up. Lo- okay, spoiler alerts for everybody. He ends up being. Having a groupie that is a serial killer, following him around, he ends up losing his family or his wife to a murder by his former partner 
who frames him for it. He goes through all these terrible serial killer or killer situations. And there's one point, there's one scene I absolutely loved that really tells you just how far this character falls and how dark he's gotten. He is outside of his apartment. He has a revolver. His cell phone rings. It's work. Telling him, hey, we need you to come in. We got a case. He puts a bullet in the revolver, plays Russian roulette, puts the bullet and puts the gun to his mouth, I believe, or to his temple, pulls the trigger. Click. Doesn't go off. Then he reaches for his cell phone. How dark does that have to go? And that makes this Luther character very believable and definitely not boring. Well, something that you've mentioned uh, with the price, having to pay a price, heroes, how to explain it? It is easy to do something heroic and wonderful when everything's going for you. Amen. When everything is going against you and you know that the cost of doing something good is going to come out of your hide and not the people who you're you know, trying to help, they may not even know it happened. Um, it's a lot harder. Like maybe that's why the last uh, uh, Captain America movie was good. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and mm-hmm. and Jennifer, when you said um, it's a, what we like about heroes is watching them struggle to overcome their faults. I feel like that's a big part of it: struggling to overcome the part of them that doesn't want to pay the price that other people can't or won't to protect mm-hmm. themselves. Well, you're still talking about tortured heroes, and you can get away from the tortured hero, or even you know. I wouldn't that, call Captain America that tortured. No. Uh, it just depends on how you look at it. But here, my point is, is that, like, okay, an example of somebody who I don't think is a tortured hero, but I would still consider a hero, mm-hmm. is R2-D2. <laughs> He's literally the hero of every single movie of the Star Wars. So there's He's that essential. to it. He doesn't actually, in any way, shape, or form, gain anything from any of his heroic acts, though he does save the day countless times and time again. He gets no reward. He gets absolutely no credit throughout all of it. Yet, you know, he's nothing more than a robot. Maybe that's the no credit that makes him more interesting than Superman. (laughs) Possibly. Heard it here first, folks. R2-D2 is more interesting than Superman. (laughs) I like that. Uh, You can raspberry you. Well, I'm thinking, like, maybe this is the way to get the naive or uh, the more basic hero to be more interesting. Is that it's more about, like, the hero that... Uh, you focus on what he does rather than who he is. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't have to have, like, some kind of dark thing going on internally if bad things happen to him. Like, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, like, uh... Good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Arthur? The... Or... Ah, never mind. More like a uh, Aladdin, maybe. No, that's not so good. He's got kind of a peasant background. (laughs) (laughs) Say... No, Matt thinks if you're for, if you're a peasant, nah, forget you. No, go ahead. doesn't count. Uh, well, let's go back to Die Hard. Okay. <laughs> that that doesn't really work. Well, I just mean like like a naive hero. It's uh, they're, maybe they're not so interesting at the beginning, but if you put them through things over the course of it, they become interesting. You put mm-hmm. them through, the and that's how to, what they're made of. Yeah, you okay. solve the boring hero by putting them through trials. But they and have there, to be changed by it. And there is the example of Buffy. Hmm. Buffy was the boring valley girl of a time. Cheerleader. Cheerleader. Mm-hmm. She cared about how what whose nails she was, was going to be painted what. She was Cordelia. And oh, then, I thought you said males who were going to be painted <laughs> what. <laughs> it's like, but I don't the male. That That's part. how she cared about the male decade. That's how she got started. <laughs> and then she goes through the trials and she becomes... The character we see, and that's not being born. Mm-hmm. You had your hand up. Oh, no. Good. Okay, cool. That sounds some like, somewhat like coming-of-age stories. Yeah, yeah. coming-of-age yeah. stories is Which good. Which goes back yeah. to myth. Yeah. It goes back to myth. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, one thing that we haven't brought up, the pretty much the definition of a boring hero, Mary Sue. Pants. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I mentioned what? pants earlier. Oh, my goodness. I used her as that. an example. No, that's okay. But you didn't mention... 
Oh, yeah, you, yes, you your pants earlier, yes. yes. Uh, Bella, otherwise known as pants, otherwise known as Lego brick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, like, Mary Sue is, like, a good uh, example, because, like, as far as I know... It's the, a generic name for the example. The most, yeah. the most essential, like, uh, quality of a Mary Sue is that they solve everything too easily. Yes. They suck all the drama They're out of the perfect. story by just, like, everyone likes them and everything goes too well. Oh, well, the interesting thing they is they often enough. die. That's the one thing. Yeah, well, that's Sue, to their there's, credit, too. There's, like, uh, a Mary Sue is, like, getting one of those freezer pop boxes, and you reach in, you don't know which flavor you're getting out, but it's going to be one of, like, six. Yeah. Mm. The Mary Sue fits tropes. Like, they're basically what they are, are they are people who don't know how to write a good character, experimenting with stuff they've seen other people do that they liked and putting it in their character and learning by writing that character. Which is part of many writers' journeys. Hey, so I, go on, no, write your Mary Sue. I've written Mary Sue. Jen's Sue's actually throwing that out. totally well, right that the hero, I mean, and that's the problem. That's the boring hero is they're filled with cliches. By exactly. the way, if anyone wants to, I, it's definitely worth the effort to try and find the original Mary Sue. It's actually a very funny poem that was published in an actual magazine that predates the internet. Mm-hmm. Hmm? There's a lot of good I was literature. Most of what we've talked about predates the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Sue's, well, though, people would assume started on fanfiction.net. Well, <laughs> Mary Sue's are too perfect. They uh-huh. suck the conflict and thus the life, the tension out of stories. So anything that comes up against them is kind of, we it seems talk. engineered. We should talk about this on another episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to use a couple of examples of Mary Sue's that have lasted. And have and are loved by their fandoms. And in fact, we've mentioned them: James Bond, James Superman. Bond, Superman, <laughs> Perry Mason. Oh my God, that guy's still that that character's still around, being read. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the t- old '60s movie, '60s television shows on DVD. You get a lot of them, and there's a lot from that time period that come out. The Mary Sues weren't so much Mary Sue, or they were Mary Sues. They were loved. Uh, that type of character was loved at that time. I think one of the things that the Mary Sue's in that time period of commercial fiction, which is mostly focused on plot, and that literary fiction, which is mostly focused on the character, have started to merge finally in this last couple of decades, definitely the 90s up to the current day, is finally irregardless of the civil war that goes on in the industry between the two sides, they're learning, finally learning from each other on how to improve that each side of that art. Well, I don't know. I'd say commercial fiction is getting more literary. I don't know. Uh, literary yeah. is getting more commercial. Okay, I definitely will say, I'll definitely go with the first one. I'm not 100% certain. It's just the they're going one. from I'm the line. Yes. Yes. yes, they're going from... Avengers would really to, like to think that it is literary. They're going yes. from two sides of the movie. same coin to a yin-yang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a moral gray in the, uh, in the delineation between literary and commercial. We just like in everything in else. Episode. Just like in everything else. We're making else. up topics. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are making them up. I'm just pointing them out. Yeah, we should talk about how heroes are heroes and don't make them boring. Make them characters and yes. then you'll be fine. And on that note, and everybody... torture the hell out of them. <laughs> make them suffer. Make them suffer. <laughs> and on that point, everybody, I want to thank our listeners for listening. You can find the Right Pack Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and now you can find it on iTunes. Yay! Yay! Thank you for listening. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Right Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is an online bookstore specializing in new and used high-quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.